The following program is sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. I want to talk to you for a few moments today on altars, wells, and encounters. Altars, wells, and encounters. There are three generations that are talked about over and over in the Bible. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Three generations. The first generation, Abraham, got everything that he received from God. He started out with nothing. He became mightily blessed in amazing ways. But he got everything that he received from God by prayer, by an altar. Isaac, the next generation, received everything that he received from God by inheritance. It was given to him by his father. But he had to learn to redig the wells that his father dug. And then finally, the third generation, Jacob, the generation of Jacob received everything that he got in a different way. He tried to take shortcuts. His name means schemer. And he was using his own intellect. He thought that he knew more through his intellect. He could get to where he was supposed to be by his mind, not by building an altar or digging a well. The first generation represented by Abraham was a generation of prayer. The great outpouring in the book of Acts was not born in a planning committee. The great outpouring of Acts chapter 2 was born out of a prayer meeting where for 50 days men and women gathered in the upper room. They did not plan and scheme and come up with visions and marketing. They got in a room and they prayed and they sought God in a prayer meeting for 50 days and they waited on the Lord. They prayed until the heavens were moved. They prayed until the rain began to pour in that upper room and it would move across the earth. Abraham built seven altars in his lifetime. It would not have been hard to follow Abraham because everywhere that he stayed any amount of time, he built an altar in that place. And then he would move on and live in another area and build an altar. And in his life, he left seven altars. Those altars to me speak of four things. An altar speaks of four things. First of all, an altar speaks of sacrifice. It was on one, of those, on one of those altars that Abraham laid his son Isaac and raised the knife and was willing to sacrifice his boy in obedience to what God was calling him to do. God stopped him from doing it, but he had to reach the point of ultimate sacrifice. That sacrifice was so real in the history of the early church. And I'm saying to you that at some point your relationship with God has to go beyond what God can do for you. And you develop an altar and the altar speaks of sacrifice. Where Christianity to you means more than one day out of seven. It means more to you than one dollar out of ten. It means more to you than an occasional sacrifice. But it begins to alter the way that you live because an altar requires sacrifice. This generation must reach a point where we stop sacrificing sacrifice out of our Christianity and assuming that it's only what I want to do when I want to do it for the Lord is all that I offer God. But the very theme of sacrifice is I don't do what I feel like doing. I do this as a sacrifice of my time and my life in honor to my king. That's what is developed out of an altar. Secondly, an altar speaks of cleansing. Abraham came to the altar to make sure everything was clean between him and God. He understood that through the shedding of the blood of an animal, his sins under the old covenant could be rolled over and they could be removed from his life temporarily. 
I heard a story about a man who wanted to, he was feeling job insecurity and he wanted to check up on his condition of his job and whether or not he was going to be fired. He felt insecure. He felt like his boss was going to replace him for whatever reason. So one day he called in, disguised his voice and asked for the boss. The boss came on the line and he said in a disguised voice, uh, I'm looking for a job. And the boss said, what kind of job? And he began to describe every detail of the things that he said he was skilled in and it fit perfectly the job he was presently holding and doing for that boss. And then he ended by saying, his little resume that he gave, he ended by saying, I heard that you weren't happy with the man you've got in that position over there and I'd love to fill it. And the man said, oh no, that's not true. I have a good man there and I want to keep him. And then he was so excited, he lost his fake voice. And he said, it's me, boss. And I was just wanting to call and check up to see how I was really doing. <laughs> that is what prayer is. Prayer is calling up heaven and is saying, God, I don't want anything in the, in the relationship. I want you to cleanse me. Prayer is cleansing. Prayer speaks of being cleansed, of removing anything and everything from the power of God operating in your life. An altar speaks of unity. Did you know that once upon a time there were no denominations, there were no labels, there were no, uh, you know, moves of God and camps over here in this camp and that church in this church. But there was, we were, according to the scripture, baptized by one spirit into one body. Men united from different persuasions in America around the 1900s, at the beginning of the 1900s, they united in revival in an altar and they prayed from different persuasions that God would send revival. And then lastly, an altar speaks of the place of prayer. When men take time to seek the face of God, they take time and discipline to seek the counsel of God, the will of God, the way of God, it's critical. That early generation, and many of you are the byproduct like me of those who've gone before us who they built an altar and they understood the power of prayer. Abraham built an altar. And then along came Isaac. And everything that Isaac received, the Bible said in Genesis chapter 25, and Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Notice that. It was by inheritance. The problem with inheritance sometimes is this. The person who receives doesn't fully appreciate the sacrifice, the calloused hands, the tremendous price, the sacrifice, the doing without that the previous generation has gone through to get you where you are today. And Isaac just received. The Bible said Abraham, his father, gave him everything that he had. He just handed it to him. And he didn't really understand personally how that dream had become a tangible reality that he was standing in. He took it for granted. I, Isaac had a lot going for him. He had a great father. He had a religious upbringing. In spite of it all, in spite of all that he would inherit, listen to me carefully, he had to meet God for himself. There came a time when it was not enough to hear about mother's touch and daddy's experience or even the fact that I was brought up in a Christian home. All of that is good. All of that is fine. But you hear me, the Lamb's book of life is listed in individual names, not family names. There's no family names in the Lamb's Book of Life. 
It doesn't say Franklin. It says Jensen Franklin, Sharice Franklin. And if my children don't encounter the same God we encountered, their names will not go in that book. It's an individual thing. And just because you've been raised in it, and just because you've been around greatness, and just because you have a grandmother who's godly, it does not mean you have encountered God for yourself. Isaac learned that he had to redig the wells of ancient revival, that his father had left him a well, but the Philistines had plugged it up. And I like the fact I was reading it again this week uh, as I was traveling, and the Bible said that he actually, Isaac actually dug two new wells before he redug his dad's old well. In other words, he thought, well, that old fashioned stuff, I don't need that. Oh, they're silly. I don't need church. I don't have to go. I can worship at home. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't believe in tithing. I don't, God, I just don't. Your mom and dad, that was for you. But my, I'm digging me some new wells. But the Bible said those two new wells dried up. And I want to preach just a minute to the young people here. You go off to university and you let them tell you what a joke this book is. And you let them laugh at your old-fashioned Bible clinging and calling on the name of Jesus. But any new well you dig, it's a matter of time before it dries up. But we've left you one that if you'll redig it, there's living water there. We've left you one that I don't care how many people make fun of it. When you get in the crisis, when it's your baby that needs a miracle or it's it's your family that's in a crisis. The only thing that's going to stand is the word of I know what the professor said, but he's miserable. I know what smarty pants said, but they can't hold a marriage together. Their lives are a mess. They're all jacked up, drunk, and high all the time. There's an old well where there's living water, and it makes you feel alive again. Hallelujah. Somebody give God praise if you believe. Glory. We need an Isaac generation. Ours is a rich spiritual heritage. Men and women of bygone days dug wells, spiritual wells, at deep cost. <laughs> Lastly, Abraham built altars. Isaac came along and encountered God and Redug wells. But Jacob, the third generation, his name means deceiver. He took shortcuts to every blessing. Do you remember what he did to his brother? His brother was hunting. He was the oldest, therefore the firstborn, therefore would receive the blessing of Abraham and Isaac, and now it would come on Esau. But he came home from a hunting trip, exhausted and starving. And he smelled the aroma of the meal that his brother Jacob had fixed, the tantalizing aroma of that bean soup. He was starving, and he said, give me some. And if that had been me and that was my brother, I'd have, I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd have given him some soup. That's just the kind of guy I am. But, 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 not, but not, listen to this, not Jacob. Jacob said, I want the blessing, but I don't want to get it the way that others have got it. I want the shortcut. I've intellectually figured this thing out. Scheming. You give me the birthright, I'll give you the beans. And in a moment of weakness, Esau gave him the birthright. He didn't just want the birthright. He didn't just deceive and treat his brother wrong. Then he turned around and his father, Isaac, who was on his deathbed, had lost his vision. And the Bible said while he was eating the meal and distracted, he went in and took goat's hair and put it on his arms because his brother was hairy. And he went in and he disguised his voice and he said, Father, Father, bless me, Father. I have the birthright in my hand. Bless me. 
It's your son Esau. And his dad said something interesting. His dad said, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. It's a huge little lesson right here. The Bible said he went by his, what he felt instead of what he heard. Anytime you start letting your feelings go above what God is saying, your feelings will always deceive you and take you in the wrong direction over what God is telling you. We don't walk by our feelings if it feels right, but the Word says it's wrong your feelings are wrong and the word is right. What you hear is right. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Can't trust your feelings, but you can trust the voice. Listen. So think about it. And then he goes to his father-in-law and his father-in-law ripped him off for 14 years because you reap what you sow. But then he turns around and rips his father off and takes the choice breeding animals and, st and steals them and goes away. So he's ripped off and deceived his brother, burned that bridge. He's ripped off and deceived his father. Don't you know his father was heartbroken when he found out the truth? burn that bridge. His father-in-law burned that bridge. I'm sure his wife was upset with him because of that. Burn that bridge. And now he finds himself at a place called Jabok. And the word Jabok means the place of breaking. He's all by himself. He's got stuff. He's got wealth. And then the thought hits him. I'm here and I have never encountered and I do not have what my grandfather Abraham had. I do not have what my father Isaac had. I don't have an altar. I don't have a whale. I have nothing. And suddenly he cries out to God and he says, I want to. I want to have a fresh encounter with you for myself. I, can't, I thank you for what you did in other generations, but I want you to touch me, my generation, me. I need to know you, not up here, but in here. And the Bible said God dispatched an angel. And the angel came. And Jacob grabbed that angel and wrestled with him until that angel touched the hollow of his thigh and disjointed his leg. He was wrestling with that angel. He's having his own encounter with God at the place of breaking. He's broken. He, every relationship in his life is broken. All of his dreams are broken. Everything at Jabok is messed up, but it's there. The very place of breaking becomes the very place of blessing. That any time God allows you to end up at the river Jabok, broken, alone, disillusioned, what has happened in my life? How did this happen? What is going on? I tell you what is going on. It's a Bible pattern. Moses go to the desert for 40 years and lose everything broken. Job, you're going to go through the trial of your life and you'll lose everything broken. Joseph, you're going to be thrown into a prison for 14 years for a crime you didn't commit broken. Paul, I'm going to knock you off your high horse and you're going to fall in the dirt and for three days you'll go blind and you won't even know who you are anymore. Broken. But if you read the last chapter of all four of those illustrations I just gave you, you'll see this fact that the breaking was where the blessing always came. Always. And I close with this. There are three great lessons that I want you to get, and I can give them to you in three sentences. 
Sometimes you have to hold on to God. This is what Jacob teaches us with, in wrestling with that angel. For his own encounter with God. Sometimes you have to hold on to God longer than your flesh wants to. If you're going to get an answer from the throne. Notice that he's crippled now. But the thing about a cripple is all he can do is cling. And if God has crippled you in some area, it wasn't to hurt you. It was to make you cling to him. And I can't get there on my own, but I'm going to hold tight to you now. I've learned in the place of breaking that, that I'm crippled in this area now, but it'll cause me to cling to you, Jesus. Secondly, victory in Jacob's life came by a touch. Nick, y'all know me. I feel like I'm surrounded with angels right now. Like I'm keenly aware the presence of God is in this room. You listen to me. You listen to me. Victory came by a touch. What kind of touch? An exhilarating touch? An exciting touch? A fun, happy, hallelujah touch? No. A touch of breaking a touch of crippling. Lastly, this story teaches us that after you have your encounter with Jesus, Jacob never walked the same again. And every friend who knew him before, when they saw him after this encounter, they all recognize one thing. He has a different walk. It changed his walk. Before, if they saw the shape of someone coming, they knew that's old, oh, proud, arrogant, deceiving, self-centered Jacob. He would walk in and you could see him coming. But now his walk has changed. He's got a limp. Because when you truly encounter Jesus, he changes your walk. And I'm praying some of you will have such an encounter with Jesus today that you leave here with some spiritual swag. This is spiritual swag. I'm clinging to Jesus and I can't even make it. I don't want to go anywhere that he doesn't want me to go. I only go where he goes with me. And if Jesus can't go, you can have it. I'd rather cling to him. I have a new walk. I have a new talk. I have a new life. And I wonder... I know when it happened to me. I know when I had a Jacob encounter when I was 16 years old that I left that building and that service changed. I didn't know what the future held, but I knew one thing. I was clinging on to him and nothing would ever separate me again. And that's the truth. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. I've failed the Lord many times, but my, 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 my lameness, my crippled place causes me to cling, not run. And there's a whole new generation of Jacobs that know about him up here and you've sat for years and years and years see all these young people. But you need a well, you need an altar, and you need an encounter. And I close with this. Sometimes victory means defeat. Sometimes you have to lose physically to win spiritually. In the natural world, you lose, it looks like, but in the spiritual world, you just stepped up into God's holy spotlight. And it happened not at a happy place, but at a J-Bock brokenness. Weeping, 
loneliness, crying, wondering, will I ever see the light again? I know you can't avoid the altar of Abraham. You can't avoid the well of Isaac. And you can't avoid the encounter of Jacob in a personal way in your life. As you've watched this program today, I don't believe that God is finished with you. He's a God of restoration. He's here to restore you, to heal you, to love you. And today, if you are ready to get right with God, if you feel far from Him, and it seems like your dreams have been torn to pieces, wherever you are watching this program, pray with me right now. Say, Lord Jesus, just say these words, Lord Jesus. I call on you, I need you, here's my broken life, here's the broken pieces of the dream that has been shattered, but I thank you that you are the restorer, you are the one who can take the broken pieces and make something beautiful out of my life. I surrender to you, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. I'd love to hear from you, and if you prayed that prayer, just pick up the phone and dial the number or go online and tell us what God has done in your life. I believe today that the Word of God is changing everything in your life. And I wanna ask you to join us with an urgent need that we have to build a home for teenage girls who are struggling with addiction. Their lives have been torn to pieces. The devil has whispered failure to them. And if we don't intervene in time, He'll drive them to the lowest, darkest place he can put them in. But we can change the way the story ends for these girls. Their failure does not have to be final. We're going to build a safe place for them to be cared for, fed, clothed, counseled, and loved. And most importantly, restored by the power of Jesus Christ. I can't wait to see this home built and filled with girls from the age of 14 to 17 who desperately need the restoration power of Jesus Christ. My announcer's gonna share how you can be a part of this miracle. Alcohol and drug abuse is a devastating epidemic in the United States today, with young girls and women becoming the fastest growing demographic. Nearly five million women over the age of 12 have a substance abuse problem, and over 200,000 of them die each year due to their addictions. These women need your help. This month, we're partnering with New Beginnings to build a dormitory for teenage girls struggling with addiction. Your generosity will assist in building this new dorm, as well as giving recovery, hope, and the life-changing message of Jesus. For your gift of $35 or more, you'll receive Jensen Franklin's message, Your Failure is Not Final, and Custom Bookmark. With your gift of $300 or more, you'll also receive God's Masterpiece Journal and the Jensen Franklin Legacy Bible. With your generous seat of $1,000 or more, your name will be commemorated on a wall of recognition at New Beginnings, and you'll receive this special edition Legacy Bible. Your generosity will save countless lives of young girls by showing them the life-transforming love of Jesus. Visit us online today. This program has been sponsored by friends and partners of Kingdom Connection. We hope you've enjoyed this teaching by Jensen Franklin, and thank you for your continued support of this ministry. Your prayers and financial support make these programs possible. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.